we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna just sarge on because that's what it's all about. When life hands you lemons, you just sarge on. You just sarge on of a cod. You, when life, when you, when life's got you down, you don't know who to turn to. You turn to Sargon of a cod. Sargon of a cod made me everything that I am today: rational, atheist, MGTOW, libertarian. When I saw Sargon of a cod, I knew that I had found my guru for life, who was going to help me. And here I am. Thank you, Sargon. Thank you, Sargon. Who is Sargon of Akkad? According to Wikipedia, Sargon was the first ruler of the Akkadian Empire, known for his conquests of Sumerian city-states in the 24th and 23rd centuries BC. However, as described by Encyclopedia Dramatica, the name refers to a fat MRA alcoholic e-beggar, failed game developer, and circle-jerking YouTubing parasite. The truth probably lies somewhere in the middle. Otherwise known as Carl Benjamin, this portly neckbeard has seen his channel grow to almost 1 million subscribers, with content ranging from identity politics, feminism and political correctness, to Brexit, social justice and the alt-right. And having amassed a dedicated following of highbrow e-thinkers, Sargon has become something of a celebrated renaissance man to a growing number of professorial LARPers and Romanian rodents. However, Sargon of Akkad is someone who has continually divided opinion, with his current Kiwi Farms thread sitting at over 700 incredibly mixed pages of Sargonian debate, with many convinced of his lolcal status given his constant gravitation towards YouTube dramatics, others disagree, citing his important work towards opposing Marxist elites and their incessant waves of multiculturalist progressivism. But whatever your opinion of Carl the Brain Benjamin, one thing is for certain, this contemptuous garden gnome is a subject of great interest. This documentary will examine the events that have helped shape Sargon's erratic path, and in doing so, inspect whether his values as represented by a catalogue of ideological content potentially stand in stark opposition to behaviours he often exhibits. This documentary will further explore how, with Sargon's progression from shitposting smug lord and Kekistani meme killer to galaxy-brained political statesman, many are left wondering whether his political ambitions may be doing more harm than good. The law surrounding Sargon of Akkad is both deep and severely autistic, and as a result, this documentary will feature the most integral talking points to aid an overall narrative. Additionally, it's important to note that the underlining objective here is not to undermine Sargon's election campaign for European Parliament. This is simply a summation of materials that already exist, chronicling the online footprints left by one of YouTube's most controversial figures. Ladies and gentlemen, I present Sargon of Akkad. For a deep-thinking sage of such scholastic reputation, Carl Benjamin's academic background is actually less than impressive, having achieved grades well below the national average when graduating high school. His schooling was comically cut short, having failed two of his three courses in further education. This included a botched attempt at passing general studies, a popular subject amongst low IQ teens otherwise engaged in nitrous balloon parties and the nonchalant sharing of genital disease. But for Carl, there existed more pressing concerns, such as where to position his legion of Protonian knights to prevent a relentless counter from the Dark Elves of Nagaroth. Carl's fascination with all things fantasy even saw him try his sausage-fingered hand at writing fiction. Into the Aether would represent Sargon's ill-fated attempt at immersing himself in the same retarded fairy tale worlds he'd spend hours each day role-playing in. Short stories such as The Call, Mind Over Matter, and The Halls of Madness drew almost no response whatsoever, as a webpage of empty message boards and unanswered posts drew a much needed curtain to Carl's short lived literary career. Eroth is the good and the light, brothers and sisters, the preacher bellowed to his congregation. His voice echoed powerfully around the small chapel. As he entered the gates of oblivion and stood before the enemy, did he not declare, it is the faith of all good men to be both the saviour and the damned? The townsfolk gathered before him murmured in agreement. I cannot hear you. Eroth is the way. They chorused reluctantly. The preacher slammed his hand down on his podium. It is his will protecting us from the enemy! He needs our strength so that he may prevent the enemy from enslaving us once more and dooming us to an eternity of servitude. 
do not take your faith lightly, brothers and sisters, for dark times are coming and only his grace and sacrifice will see us saved. Some six years later, Carl Benjamin would take the first steps of his YouTube journey, uploading a series of potato sound conversations on the subject of feminist video game critic Anita Sarkeesian. These videos represented the beginning of Sargon's relentless obsession towards the bulbous nosed Armenian. Dictionary.com defines conversation as the informal interchange of thoughts, information, etc. by spoken words or communication between persons. We are not having a dialogue, Anita. You are talking to us. You mean a lecture. Three words and two seconds in, and you've already misinterpreted the meaning of a word. Having picked a name befitting his narcissistic fantasies, the five foot seven men's rights activist expanded his contents to the many evils of third wave feminism, dedicating his entire channel to the extreme exploits of a handful of mentally ill women. Feminists are generally massively unpleasant people to be around. No one wants to be a massively unpleasant person to be around, and for some reason feminists can't seem to see how unpopular they are. And so they get in everyone's shit and they're like, blah blah blah, you must do this my way, you must do this this way, blah 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 blah. And everyone's like, look, fuck off. As his YouTube channel grew, so too did his mega-minded self-assurance. And despite failing miserably as a creative writer, a chest-puffing Sargon was not deterred. Having dedicated his formative years to wrestling goblins or slaying wizards or whatever it is you do in Warhammer, Carl's childlike imagination was once again abuzz with fairy tale adventures. Along with Rush Jarvis and Giuseppe Constantino, the trio would create their very own tower defense strategy game, Necromancer. I'm Russ. And I'm Carl. And we're two thirds of other world software. We'd like to present Necromancer, something we like to call a reverse zombie apocalypse game. You and the Necromancer are risen from the grave and determined to start the zombie apocalypse. To achieve this, you have an army of mindless, shambling zombies that you can raise to do your bidding. It won't be that easy though, as against you are a group of survivors and heroes who know what you're doing and are coming to stop you, and they are good at killing zombies. If you like the sound of this, please pledge now to help kickstart the zombie apocalypse. By some miraculous act of a god Sargon the Skeptical as on many occasions debunked, over $8,000 was raised for the project, with pledges up to $500 for the privilege of naming characters and receipt of a unique forum rank. Unfortunately for the backers, very little evidence of any sort of playable product would ever surface. And given the early demo was so badly optimised that you'd need the IBM Summit to achieve double digit frame rates, things did not look good for the trio of bungling developers. Throughout the pledge drive, Sargon would continue to placate supporters, with a combination of shameless plugs and ambiguous updates. Okay, time for a little shameless self-promotion, if you'll allow me, and I do apologise if I'm telling you things you already know, please feel free to ignore this video. But I've had a lot of new subscribers recently, so I thought it might be worth telling people that I actually have two other channels. The first one is a gaming channel called Ve Victus, where I have done a Necromancer development stream, so you can go and see me actually working on the game if you would like to see that. It was actually a huge amount of fun to do once I finally got the software working and I'll definitely be doing more in future. But following claims that Giuseppe, the shady Italian responsible for the game's shitty artwork, had quit before attempting to extort the remaining team, the project was well and truly circling the drain. I'm not I'm not going to lie, there, there was a lot of miscalculation on my part. I, as everyone knows, I'm sure, this is the first game that I've been developing properly, and so I was wildly optimistic, I won't lie. But the, this situation wasn't helped by our artist quitting directly after the Kickstarter was successful and trying to extort us for money. So I became the artist. This is one of the primary reasons that there's been such a long delay, is that I've been the one making all of the levels and trying to make everything look good. And I'm, I'm no artist, so I've had to learn a hell of a lot by doing it. As it stands, no official completed version of Necromancer has ever been released. Additionally, it is not clear whether Sargon had returned any of the money invested, in what was at best a severely unplayable experience, boasting low-res assets, repetitive animations, and literally no underlining concept whatsoever. Yeah, but honestly, right, I, I was actually really, and I, I was really genuinely disappointed in him because we thought we were friends with him. So to have him then say, oh, no, we're quitting the pro I'm quitting the project and I want you to give me $1,500 or you can't use my models. Well, then did you have a contract with him? Um, I think we did. Yeah. And his demand was give us his demand was give me lots of money and I'm quitting the project and you can use the models that I've made or 
you can't use my models. And so we don't use his models. None of his models are in the current version of the game. The, the issue is that he was annoyed that we hadn't given him any money. But the thing is, we hadn't, we, we weren't like employing him. He was a partner in, a, in the group. This so he was part owner of the company? Well, that's what we were trying to make him. As for Sargon's YouTube channel, things would go from strength to strength, with his flagship show This Week in Stupid gaining serious momentum. The series took a dry and somewhat satirical view on the week's events, and the popularity of the show saw Sargon quickly propelled into the YouTube mainstream. Hello everyone, welcome to This Week in Stupid for the 6th of March 2016. If you find anything you'd like to see in This Week in Stupid, tweet using hashtag TWIS, or post it to our Sargon of Akkad, and I'll find it. It was just complete try-hard cringe. I mean, look at this picture. If this isn't the most try-hard fucking picture I've ever seen, I don't know what is. That's it. That is the entire BuzzFeed article. Elamin Abdel Mahamoud got paid his day's wages to write three fucking words for BuzzFeed. Th these guys didn't come up to you and start the violence. But this is not, they don't interview the clansmen. They go, what, what was it like being beaten on the floor by these protests? It's fucking awful. But it was a phenomenon known as Gamergate that gave Carl of Akkad the greatest of signal boosts. For those rock-dwelling boomers who, for whatever reason, still don't know what Gamergate was, here's a very quick summary. Zoe Quinn, a promiscuous video game developer responsible for the interactive waste of time depression quest, was ousted in a blog written by her ex-boyfriend Erin Joni as a fat, disgusting whore and all-round awful human being. In response, Zoe caught the attention of a good friends in video game publication, claiming justified backlash she received from the blog post represented a wider misogynist problem towards the treatment of women in video games. Hello everyone. I really wanted to do a video like this, where I just have a bit of a ramble and tell you just why this all matters so much to me. I really wish that these social justice warriors could understand that, look, what you guys are talking about, and all the things that you guys are talking about, are very unimportant to the actual business of gaming. There's literally no other activity like it, really that really exists as such an individualistic, meritocratic community. So this is why I'm so offended, so deeply, mortally offended, that these corrupt bastards are meddling with my hobby. These publications then united to co-opt an accusatory message of bigoted evils towards their very own readership. It wasn't long before the likes of Anita Sarkeesian and Brianna Wu leapt at the chance of profile boosting as a result of this new anti-patriarchal movement, with Wu even running for Congress on the back of online harassment against women. This prompted a tsunami of criticism from just about anybody with an AdSense account, as waves of click-thirsty grifters clung to the Gamergate narrative. But games journalism is all in San Francisco. They're all located right there, which is why they all know each other, why they're all friends. And then they get the indie dev scene, which is in San Francisco. It's like, but this is where they, if you look and see who is on each other's podcasts, who is on each other's shows, who writes, you know, for each other's websites from time to time, uh, and opinion pieces, you start seeing just how, like, it just entwined it all is. You know, you are an up and coming YouTuber, much like myself. Mm -hmm. People tend to talk about these things, okay? Yeah. And if something starts going around YouTube that's getting any kind of traction, people are going to start talking. Larger channels are going to start picking up on it. Yeah. You know, Internet Aristocrats, at, he was at 42,000 subscribers when his video launched. He's now at over 50. With general sentiment favoring those fighting against video game journalists and the relentless ideological campaign, Gamergators saw this as one of the first major victories against the regressive left. However, the official narrative still cites the movement as being little more than a neo-Nazi harassment campaign against poor little girls who didn't do nothing. So let's let's jump into Gamergate for a second and then we'll get back to some of that stuff because Gamergate I think is one of the things that really sort of put you on the map. For me, it is it's a very definite reaction to regressives infiltrating the video game media. But then the regressives turned up and started being corrupt in a whole different way. Instead of instead of being motivated by money, which I suppose is to their credit, they were motivated by ideology, and so now they would hire people into positions and promote things that were all based on cronyism. And then they would start writing articles like, 
are these video games sexist? Why are these video games misogynist? There are no trans people in these video games. This is racist. This is, you know, the, the, the standard regressive lines. Yeah, 101. And it, yeah, and they would be promoting very famous feminists like Anita Sarkeesian or Zoe Quinn. When Anita Sarkeesian did her Kickstarter, it was everywhere. Everyone knew about it. And yet, everyone also knew that the arguments she was presenting were half-truths. They were cherry-picked. They were, she was finding individual examples that didn't really represent the gaming industry or any even, you know, subsections of the gaming industry. As one of the spearheads of the Gamergate movement, Sargon was understandably reluctant to let a good thing go. Gamergate had provided the likes of Milo Yiannopoulos, Mundane Matt, and the Internet Aristocrat a veritable bounty of hot-button talking points, as just about anybody who picked up the Gamergate ball saw their channel subs explode in a pre-Trumpian frenzy. I, I just, you know, I, I, I think the thing that's floored me the most is I, I've been looking through the Gamergate tag and kind of reading up on some of the stuff I missed, and it seems like people are killing it. Like, people are knocking this shit out of the ballpark. So I'm, I'm wondering, like, well, there's, like, a little bit of infighting here and there, and there's a little bit of doubt here and there. Like, you guys have, all the people that have taken part in this Gamergate thing, you have crushed a multi-million dollar company. You've you've stood up against the biggest PR blitz you're probably ever going to see from mainstream media and walked away unfucking scathed. Nobody's done that. Occupy Wall Street fell on their ass. Anonymous didn't. They weren't able to do it. But for some reason, a bunch of spurgy gamers can. That's just amazing <laughs> to me. But as Gamergate drew to a close, Sargon's assault on those he opposed during the movement only intensified. The bearded fat cell concentrated his entire energy towards Anita Sarkeesian's every move, desperate to maintain his channel's anti-feminist momentum. Especially with Anita, I mean, she never quantified any of the harm that was apparently done. So when Anita says that she is not interested in individual women's choices, she is serious. Let's assume that the, every every critique of Anita Sarkeesian's was completely true. It shows why Anita Sarkeesian could make such an off-the-cuff comment. Anit Sarkeesian will frame that as patriarchal oppression. He's doing this in response to Anit Sarkeesian's brand new crowdfunding campaign, in particular I suppose in the case of Anit Sarkeesian. But the thing is, we know that this isn't actually the sum total of the money Anit Sarkeesian makes. I mean, Anit Sarkeesian's making a bunch of claims. What I can't understand Anita. Oh my god, Anita's speaking here. Who is harassing Anita Sarkeesian? But following significant investment from Intel into Sarkeesian's feminist frequency website, in efforts to increase diversity and inclusivity in the tech sphere, this obsession with the Adam Friedland facsimile led to accusations of harassment at the feet of a hapless Carl Benjamin. Let, let's call this what it is. You and the other feminazis in the gamer world are coming for our balls to snip them off, put them into a little felt purse, and take them away so we have to play your non-violent games, right? No, that's not true. It's a culture war. It's um, a subculture war. There is something going on, and what it is is women being harassed and threatened and terrorized for... After you first attacked male gamers for enjoying looking at big-breasted women with tiny armor that barely covers their nipples. <laughs> what is wrong with that? I like what that looks like. Like, game ethics and journalism is not what's happening in any way. It's, mm -hmm. it's actually men going after women in really hostile, aggressive ways. Mm -hmm. That's what Gamergate is about. It's about, like, ter like, terrorizing women for being involved in this industry, for being involved in this hobby. You have benefited from threats made at you. Just so we're clear, I mean, you, you have directly financially benefited from it. You've benefited in many other ways that aren't financial as well. You get to give talks to thousands of people. You get to appear on the Colbert Report. You are certainly no use to the video game industry, and you're no use to the video game industry because you are a charlatan. You're an imposter. You are here under false pretenses. You do not care about games. You do not care about gaming. Your threats sound made up, and they sound like they were made up by feminists. They sound like they were made up by feminists who are pushing an agenda, an agenda that you are profiting from. Such was Sargon's manic fixation towards Anita Sarkeesian that he spent over three hours fawning over Davis Arini, a self-titled white nationalist, race realist, and what appears to be a deeply closeted magician. Why blacks fail? You should be absolutely furious with the niggers, not the blacks, the fucking niggers. On paper, 
I have nothing against white nationalism. Orini was at the time raising funds for an Anita Sarkeesian documentary titled The Sarkeesian Effect, and as expected, Sargon was all in. Hello everyone, I'm having a conversation with Davis Orini. You may know him from doing the Sarkeesian Effect documentary, which I will put a link to in the description after this, but you can probably also find by the link that's in the description to his channel, which you should check out. Aurini's rather transparent objective here was fairly simple. Use post-Gamergate traction to cast a crowdfunding net into an ocean of anti-Sarkeesian sentiment. And despite raising $50,000 according to IMDB, the film was riddled with the most basic of audiovisual issues. In, in a, in a uh, Westboro Baptist Church kind of way. We did a couple more tweets like that. Started putting up a Patreon. These are, so these are our readers. So bear in that in mind that they're the customer. So I've had a long history of editing. I, I had over a thousand articles edited. Such was the lack of technical quality that any two-bit low-rent faggot could have done the exact same shit for free. Speaking of which, don't forget to hit that subscribe button. Along with director Jordan Owen, a Down Syndrome embodiment of Dick Masterson, Orini's filmmaking legacy seems to have now all but petered out. Now I'd just like to leave you with this one question. It's to those people who donated to the production of this. Owen and Orini have taken it and produced this thing, right? So how completely and utterly shafted do you feel right now? Meanwhile, Sargon's first real foray into political campaigning saw him lead a petition against what he perceived to be the social justice indoctrination of university students. There is an anti-feminist YouTube user by the name of Sargon of Akkad, and a few days ago he recently made a petition addressed to universities, no, not a specific university, not even universities within a specific location, just universities generally, um, okay, good luck with that, uh, calling on them to temporarily suspend uh, what's called social justice courses. As pointed out by potato-faced male feminist Kevin Logan, Sargon's bizarre proposal was to essentially censor speech and bring forward more government involvement in policing ideas. Arguably the weirdest and shittest uh, petition ever set up. I don't even, I'm, I'm both simultaneously annoyed and baffled by it. Sargon has always said before that he's against the government, you know, he's, he's for like a small government, like a left-wing libertarian thing. And he's against authoritarianism, even though he wants to suspend certain courses at independent learning institutes. I mean, it's, it's baffling. The hypocrisy of being pro-free speech and pro-freedom and then wanting to do something as absurd as this is ridiculous. Sargon's response was to suggest correcting misinformation was not censorship, before seeking validation from his Transylvanian pet gerbil, V. Specifically, libertarians seem to have an issue with this, which I found very perplexing, and I heard some very strange arguments from the libertarians in favour of not banning social justice in universities, sorry, suspending it until it can be assessed and reformed to whatever degree, to just take out the misinformation and insert reality and fact into these courses and not teach them in an ideological echo chamber as if they are true to students who are there to be taught. Why are you teaching complete nonsense to people who are paying for not nonsense? It's, it, I can't believe there is an argument against from anyone, frankly, on the subject of not teaching <laughs> non-factual information it's just yeah, I mean, you know the, the problem that i have with it because i i put up your petition on my channel you know so i'm also uh, mm. responsible for the backlash which i don't see why it should be but if they would teach factual accurate things and they would come to the conclusions i don't like i would have nothing against this but when they teach like one out of five women are getting raped. That's not accurate, that's not factual. When you say white people were never slaves, that's not true. And despite the overwhelming consensus proving time and time again how fundamentally cack-handed Carl's big boy ideas were, there was no backing down for the political egghead. So, Cammy, can I call you Cammy? Cammy your bams. Man, I remember when you used to be cool. You know, before you became a crypto-leftist, crypto anarchist, fascist, commie, or whatever label you've chosen to adopt this week, man. You will have to forgive me if I am not surprised that someone who buys in social justice, hook, line, and recently discarded chains is opposed to petitioning 
to stop social justice courses in universities. You'll, you'll have to forgive me. Asking your YouTube subscribers to sign a vaguely worded petition to an unspecified institution that's going to be handed in nowhere. A grassroots movement, apparently. You fucking hemorrhoid. Oh, look, uh, Sargon of Akkad and his subscribers have said that they don't like social justice courses. Better suspend that master's degree. Like, seriously, why would they answer to you or your subscribers? You're not a part of the local community, let alone a part of the student body. You know, to them, you're just some random prick on the internet with a following and a lack of self-awareness. As Sargon's crusade against the identity-obsessed regressives continued, yet another mega-brained idea came hurtling towards the pot-bellied freethinker. In a series of conversations spanning several weeks, Sargon of Wakanda revealed that he was in fact one quarter Kang. Well, you'd be surprised actually. Um, my dad isn't white. Mm -hmm. So my granddad wasn't white and he was a black man in the 60s who married my white grandmother. My grandfather wasn't a quarter black, he was fully black. My grandfather's black on my dad's side. Sargon's motive here seems fairly straightforward. This revelation had given Carl a license to play identity politics, with little to no consequence. And although this might have helped raise shield against the neo-Marxist left, those on the right were less than sympathetic. Rather predictably, shitposting 4 chaners took this admission of black heritage and well and truly ran with it. For years, Sargon was a known 4chan meme thief, and was chiefly responsible for the death of all things Kekistani. This reverse Midas touch also saw Sargon's adoption of the Pepe meme almost cringe the frog to death. So to see Sargon now targeted by those he had so desperately tried to court over the years was by all means rather poetic. Sargon's impulsive response was to flood his own Twitter timeline with interracial pornography, in a sad attempt to troll the alt-right. Endless JPEGs of X-rated black on white gore transformed what was once a platform to share political and ideological ideas into a retarded circus of thoughtless stupidity. So, Sargon, what are you doing? What the hell are you doing? I mean, I was just Going to lunch today at work, flipped open my iPhone to see what's on the Twitter feed, see what ideas are out there, and porn. Porn all across a channel that I thought was an ideas feed. As always, Fee, the subhuman shield, was once again called upon for another round of Sargonian apologetics. While we were talking about this, someone from the alt-right comes in and calls Sargon a nigger. The reason he called Sargon a nigger is because uh, his, he has ancestry of black descent. Uh, his grandfather, actually, is uh, a black person. Now, how do you offend people that are white supremacists and they believe in the purity of the white race and they are very uh, upset if you have, like, a black person in your family tree? Wait, you send them interracial gay porn, of course, right? You, you send them a little bit of the black dicking and they had a meltdown. Sargon's Twitter account was later suspended for what Pathios.com claims, tweeting an image of a black man sucking off a white penis to a Twitter account entitled at young underscore domon. And although pornography itself is fair game under Twitter's terms of service, targeting pornography for the attention of unsuspecting users is most certainly not. Still, Sargon of bullshit would have his fans believe he was simply yet another victim of Jack Dorsey's political wrath. Hello folks, as you can see, I've been suspended from Twitter. And I don't know why, because I didn't do anything. <laughs> and so I don't really know what's going on. I mean, I, I mean, my pinned tweet is, don't send a threat. So I'm guessing it's not because I sent a threat, because obviously I don't send threats, because that's ridiculous. Or any kind of, like, harassment. It's just, it's not on. So, um, I believe people are using the hashtag FreeSargon. So if you could do me a favour and take to Twitter and use the hashtag to voice your opinion on the subject, I would greatly appreciate it. Clearly, Cole Benjamin was willfully lying in efforts to align himself to the growing number of suspended political e-celebs. And to further compound matters for the chubby Swindonian, an even bigger lie was about to be exposed. With a self-admitted black grandfather, Carl's parents should surely exhibit some signs of African heritage. However, following a series of home videos uploaded to Sargon's channel, it was crystal clear both his parents were incredibly light-skinned. So, how did you find it? Yeah, it's, I'll tell you what, with a bit of practice, that could be good fun, couldn't it? Could it? 
When pushed on this, Sargon backpedaled, claiming to not know exactly what race his grandfather was, before admitting to what he called a slip-up. But Carl had reiterated the same assertion time and time again, only to have now been comically exposed due to his own stupidity. It was generally felt that Sargon's penchant for convenient duplicity, in framing the narrative in his favour, reduced him to the same leftist tactics he'd made a career from criticising. I don't know what race he actually was, because it was never something I really cared about. And, like, I mean, he was a very dark-skinned man, but I don't think he was sub-Saharan, because he had straight hair. But he's, he, like, I mean, if you see my dad, he, he's actually got remarkably pale skin at the moment, because he doesn't really go out in the sun much. But when he was younger, he used to go out in the sun quite a lot, and he was really dark. Sargon's reckless decision to maintain a conflict with alt-right Anons saw his Twitter account hacked after failing to double-lock it. This resulted in such posts as, The c**ks are always lying about the hollow hoax, thanks for reminding me. Race war of a card, before stating that the hollow hoax never happened, just another lie by the c**ks. I wish there were six million more. In a fight he clearly had no chance of winning, Sargon of Akkad simply could not help but plant his stubby hobbit foot square into his mouth. So my Twitter account has been hacked and I can't get it back. Now this is actually, I guess, technically my fault because I hadn't double locked the account with my phone number like I've done with, you know, every other important account. I don't know how these people have hacked my account and I wouldn't even dare to speculate. But this is the fact, and so I can't use my Twitter account, and anything that comes out of it is obviously not me. Meanwhile, Sargon's insatiable desire to remain close to his Armenian waifu saw him attend a panel titled Women Online at FidCon 2017. Justifiably infuriated at being unable to escape Sargon's infatuated reach, Anita lashed out, calling him a shithead and a garbage human. If you Google my name on YouTube, you get shitheads like this dude who are making these dumbass videos. As expected, Sargon would milk the living shit out of what he called harassment and abuse, assumingly attempting to turn the tables on Anita's onslaught of Gamergate victimhood. Apparently, um, they, they essentially said, uh, it was uh, Naomi who spoke to them, and she said that uh, they had said that, you know, oh, they're worried about something going on, and then she had just said to the head of security, well, she's a public figure, she's attacking the audience, and she should be able to endure that, you know, she should be able to take it, and they were like, you know, that's a good point. And that's why they didn't check us out, they didn't do anything to us, and Anita is now the one abusing the audience. Carl's Twitter feed was literally teeming with piteous complaints, in an embarrassingly obvious attempt at reclaiming the moral high ground. Deep down, Sargon was likely aware that his valid criticism of Anita had reached levels tantamount to harassment, and this so-called attack helped shift whatever suggestions of emotional instability towards her. I attended VidCon 2017 in Los Angeles, and I went to meet a group of fellow YouTubers who deal with similar subjects. At VidCon, there were several panels that featured Anita Sarkeesian, so we thought we would attend to actually hear what she had to say, and if there was a question and answer session, Perhaps we could actually pose some of the criticism to her that we have, that she has for years, refused to address. This of course did not happen. Instead, Anita spotted us, in particular me, singled me out, and then subjected me to a torrent of abuse. It was around this time that Sargon's official Twitter account was finally suspended for good. Strangely, no explicit reason was at the time given for the suspension, with Twitter citing some sort of unspecified targeted abuse as their justification. A furious Sargon demanded further explanation in a video titled, Where is the Victim Jack? Twitter have permanently suspended me because I was attacking the alt-right. It's very strange. There isn't a victim. There is no one that I have actually targeted and harassed. I mean, who, is there anyone playing the victim on Twitter? Are they are they showing this screen cap from one of my tweets saying, look, this is what Sargon sent to me, blah, blah, blah. Because I haven't seen anything like that. And I've been looking, obviously. For the following year, Carl would cling on to his well-earned persecution at the oppressive hands of Jack Dorsey. However, new light has been shed on exactly why his account was suspended. Vijaya Gad, the legal policy and safety lead at Twitter HQ, explained exactly what triggered the suspension of Sargon of Akkad's Twitter account. What are the other strikes for Sargon? Or oh, Carl? Um, let's see. Um, there was the use of uh, a Jewish slur. Um, How do you use it? Uh, to a person, you traitor. 
Remainer, white genocide supporting Islamophile, Jewish slur lover. That should keep you going. Hashtag Hitler was right. But but these oh, aren't that, general opinions. These are targeted. These are targeted at somebody. That that sounds mm, like God, he's being boy. like he's making a joke. <laughs> So, yeah, so I understand. In context, the, uh, it sounds like the other one. Like, yeah. in context, what he's saying, particularly the fact that he's a white guy, that doesn't sound like a, a racial slur at all. I mean, he's so saying, is, fuck white people, and is he in, is white. In context, again, these okay. are tied together. Right. I, I always knew that person was not to be trusted, that fucking Jewish slur. Oh. Mm -hmm. So there's and a so lot. He's saying like, there's this a about bunch a of very things. specific person. He's targeting he's us. He's very, very, trying to be very provocative. And he's saying this I, well, about a specific Jewish person? I don't know the race of this person, I'm sorry. Right. In defense of Sargon, this allegedly anti-Semitic tweet was aimed at Andrew Anglin of white supremacist publication, The Daily Stormer, and was clearly meant in jest. As for his helicopter tweet to at Timo Geo, it's painfully obvious Carl was being hyperbolic, if a little strong worded. It remains difficult to justify removing anybody from what is essentially public discourse for such sentiments, especially given there was a larger context in both cases. It, it does sound like at least the first one was meant to be a, a critique joke. of yeah. your... So, um, Potentially, but there are a bunch of others if you want to hear them. More than sure. Uh, that, Keep it rolling. This is, again, targeted. <laughs> this is how I know one day that I'll be throwing you from a helicopter. You're the same kind of malignant cancer. Don't forget it. With a cow-worshipping robot overseeing the policing of content and absolutely no method of appeal, Twitter's terms of service are amongst Silicon Valley's worst. But one can't help but think that many of these right-leaning grifters poke the nest willingly, offering themselves up as a sacrificial lamb to the cause. Sargon has, after all, treated his Twitter feed as a verbal dumping ground for years, despite being fully aware of the repressive environment Jack Dorsey has cultivated. And to post videos afterwards sharing his insincere disbelief at his removal from the platform, smacks of manufactured outrage. If there are any Twitter accounts that are posting claiming they're me, they're not me, I'm not using Twitter. And uh, honestly, I think I'm just gonna let the platform die off. Having on multiple occasions made an embarrassing spectacle of himself in the face of who he deemed alt-right trolls, Sargon had finally stumbled on a foolproof solution. If you beat the white nationalist and race realists on ideas, you undermine their validity as a group. Once exposed intellectually, these alt-righters will have no choice but to lay down arms and bow to the mighty Karl of Swindon. But to achieve this, Sargon needed help. Cue the skeptic community. The word community means the condition of sharing or having certain attitudes and interests in common. There's a lot of resistance in the skeptic community to this term, probably because of the homogenous nature of other communities on the internet, but it is an accurate description of what we are. At Sargon's request, a miserable collective of self-important pseudo-intellectuals were tasked with humbling the alt-right with their cosmic-minded intellects. This merry band of insufferable faggots included the likes of micro-packing banana man The Amazing Atheist, scruffy tramp Thunderfoot, and estrogen-breasted gopher Mundane Matt. And along with Crowton T, Armoured Skeptic, and Jeff Holiday, a legion of cerebral goliaths were ready to destroy the alt-right with an onslaught of unshakable logic. I have enjoyed several conversations with individuals and groups of people who identify as alt-right, with the intention of understanding what this movement is. The phrase alternative right was coined by Richard Spencer in 2010 and has become an umbrella term to describe a neo-reactionary movement to push back against progressive domination of political and social spheres. The alt-rights are not liberals or conservatives, and nor do they claim to be. They are as radical as their counterparts on the authoritarian left as they both desire massive changes to the system. But no matter how hard these skeptics huffed and puffed, the alt-right remained largely unmoved. In fact, such was their lack of lasting effect that serious doubts within the community as to the overarching point began to surface. So there's been this mighty shit show going on, which mostly I've been out of because I've been moving. Now, bear in mind, I've not had a chance to go into too much detail here, so a quick summary seems to be Kraut and T decided that he was going to take on the alt-right over race realism. And let's be honest here, genetics, sure, genetics are a real factor, no question. But the folks who tend to walk down this path seem to be heading towards the eugenics route on almost as fleeky grounds. The skeptics' refusal to entertain any form of identitarianist or race realist arguments of the right, or play the neo-Marxist identity politics of the left, rendered the community a fence-sitting joke at odds with reality. 
As cute as their individualist utopia may appear, the world and its people are simply not wired that way. And as they continued having their collective arses handed to them left and right, the skeptics would soon retreat in droves to their array of super exclusive Discord servers in preparation for Operation Fight Dirty. Now, one thing I, uh, I, I find funny uh, in regards to mischievousness uh, in your server is Ryan Falk mm -hmm. later went on to have a live stream where Drelasta and David Sherratt were on there. Again, both mm -hmm. members of your server. Uh, he accused him of pedophilia uh, and mm -hmm. then said they would be posting evidence of this pedophilia and then never posted any evidence of it. Mm -hmm. Yes, and? Well, I guess what I'm saying, Crowd, is it, it sure seems like all the people involved in this server have tried to attack people on the alt-right in as many underhanded ways as possible. That was a really stupid thing to attack him on. Interestingly, doing gay shit was a favourite pastime for the skeptics. The candid scandal, for instance, saw influencers such as the amazing atheist shill for social network candid. This deliberate selling out for pay had infected skeptics like TJ Kirk to such a desperate degree that the balding troglodyte agreed to produce sponsored content, taking down fellow YouTuber harmful opinions. A staunch critic of the service's sketchy business practices at the behest of Candid CEO. Those sponsored by Candid were then contractually forced to endure a long period of not criticizing the platform, all in exchange for a big barrel of cold hard cash. Candid were able to convince skeptics such as Armored Skeptic, Shoe on Head, and The Amazing Atheist to do sponsored videos for them, where they all touted how great it was. It's not like Candid was using the AI bot I previously mentioned to filter out negative comments. It's not it's not like they were paying people to attack harmful opinions, and it's not like the skeptics that were shilling for them were forced to sign two-year non-disparagement agreements preventing them from saying anything negative about the app. No, of course not. Candid wasn't doing anything shady. Harmful opinions is just a paranoid conspiracy theorist. The platform's proprietary algorithm became subject to wide condemnation from outside the skeptic community, and with the ability to mass censor negative comments without any sort of specified standard, this entire saga left a sour taste in critics' mouths. Posts and comments on Candid uh, go through an NLP algorithm which analyzes and detects sentiment, detects things like slander and hate speech. A machine is going to detect if you are being hateful or spiteful or annoying and it's going to decide whether your like, comment or your post should stay on or this is something which should like be taken out. And it is a fun app. I genuinely love it. I'm not saying that because I'm being paid to say it. I love the fact that I can go on there and look at things like shower thoughts, like this one, where Sincere Raptor writes, what if our dreams are us in alternate universes and we just see what's going on in it? Those kind of late night musings that allow me to get my creative juices flowing when I'm trying to think of the next thing I want to write. We live in a time of mass communication thanks largely to the advent of social media, but the same social media outlets that give us a voice, Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, whatever, have also shown a tremendous proclivity for ideologically based censorship. That's why I'm proud to be sponsored by a great new social media app called Candid. I've already promoted them once before on this channel and those of my audience that checked it out loved it. They, they tested it and, and typed in um, a couple of posts. The first was uh, was kill all white people and the second was kill all black people. Uh -huh. And the uh, the kill all black people um, was, was, was removed, but the, the kill all white people wasn't. Furthermore, the apparent lackadaisical approach to child pornography appearing on the platform, in addition to their CEO threatening detractors with legal action before incentivizing the tracking down of perceived enemies like harmful opinions, this shameless shilling for Candid became another regrettable notch on the skeptic's belt. This was further compounded with Sargon himself, defending both the platform and those grifting eCelebs who mindlessly fed from Candid's rotten teat. And even if they did no research, the people sponsored by Candid, thanks to Baring, who was also sponsored telling me about this, are given a list of talking points that suggests they mention it. This means people like Shoe on Head, who in the past has viciously attacked social media platforms for using similar shadow banning systems, chose to, when paid, not mention that thing she hates. Not mention that thing her audience would hate in what she's advertising. The CEO of this company was negotiating rewards with people to track me. Being in a situation where you know people around you on the internet are taking this company's cash and that this company also tries to get people to track you, gives, leak them stuff, information, whatever, fucking sucks. Okay, so one thing that I see repeatedly is People condemning uh, Shoe and Skeptic for information that came out after they did their sponsorship. 
Uh, what information? Uh, just, you know, the sort of... Um, oh, Candid has, like, child porn on it, or Candid has an algorithm, uh, that's, you know, or something, you know, some... Well, the, al- the algorithm no, 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 thing no, no, is no, actually... The, the extent of what the deal is with the algorithm. You were explaining to me that it might be valuable to have a connection to something like uh, Candid. You were explaining that... Oh, yeah, no, not Candid side has... specifically. Yes, okay, yeah. What I was trying to explain is that the other side has institutional influence, and we don't. Then we have our resident bearded thumb, Mundane Matt, another close friend of our chief skeptic faggot, Sargon of Akkad. He was dramatically exposed as a mass false flagger, in particular of poor Ickle Matt's schoolyard bully, Dane Pesos of the Soilless Matt Show. Having been forced to reveal his flagging history on Ethan Ralph's The Killstream, Matt the Fat Jarbo admitted to being what is often referred to as bitch made, as his inability to take criticism saw him attempt to remove all detractors from YouTube's platform altogether. You disingenuous piece of shit. Delete your fucking channel, get a real job, and try to make something of yourself. Because as far as YouTube is concerned, as far as the internet is concerned, you're a joke. You're the village idiot and you have no chance of recovering from this. And do not even think of flagging this video. Because if you do, I swear to God, I will- As for Crowton T, an ostentatious gas bag with an affected accent, losing face to the alt-right was not an option. For example, following the release of a supposedly controversial video by alleged white supremacist Rage After Storm titled Race Is Real, Kraut just simply couldn't let shit slide. Instead, he contacted her employer to enlighten them as to the extreme rhetoric Rage was spewing online. She was then fired, with Kraut later joking about how he had bullied her off the internet. And in the end, your Nazi bitch queen, Rage After the Storm, as much as you would like to fantasize about her being silenced, packed her bags and ran away like a little bitch. Make no mistake, oh, we bullied the shit after Rage, Rage After the Storm. We bullied her off social media, she took herself off that shit. We bullied the fuck out of her. And then we have Kraut's Discord server. With the skeptics losing intellectual ground to the alt-right following their series of meaningless ill-fated debates, Kraut's response was to create individual channels within his server dedicated to the doxing and subsequent smearing of alt-right figures. And despite the list containing the likes of JF Garieppi, Baked Alaska, James Alsop, Richard Spencer and Nick Fuentes, it was a middle-aged tradcon known as Coach Red Pill who made the biggest of splashes. It was soon revealed, thanks largely to the exposing of the server by former skeptic Braving Ruin, that Kraut was handed what he believed to be Coach Red Pill's full dox, and along with it, accusations of sexual harassment and the extortion of business partners. Kraut then had this information posted to a Kiwi Farms thread, before excusing his shitty behaviour after being egged on by an excitable gaggle of toothpick counters as simply performing an enhanced background check. I don't know why you are engaging in the sort of culture war tactics the SJWs engage in against the alt-right. And I've said to you repeatedly, privately, that you shouldn't do this. This is a waste of time and it's not a good thing to do. And you are doing it anyway, so I'm, I'm curious to know why you're doing it. I, I really don't see the advantage. I, I have to ask, what exactly do you mean with cultural tactics? Well, you know, what? digging up people's pasts, trying to uh, sort of smear them to make them look bad, things like that. I have no idea what you're talking about. Come on. No, I, I honestly have no idea what come you're talking about. Come on, man, come on. No, you have to give me a specific example. Hello? Okay, like, find Coach Red Pill's past. Like, this sort of thing. Like, digging up... Who, who are the other people? There are, there are other people that you've... Um, what the fuck? You know, you've been digging stuff up on and, and stuff, and it's like, I don't, I don't see the point in any of that. Not only were Kraut and Sargon aligned in their efforts as skeptics to take down the alt-right, they were also close friends. In fact, such was the strong foundation of their platonic bond that Kraut admitted to having shared the Coach Red Pill docs with Carl the Don Sargoni. I, I have to tell you something, Jeff. I, I shared the things that I got on Coach Red Pill with Sargon of the Cad. Yeah, so? And he's now accusing so me of doing SJW tactics. That's not SJW tactics. That's fucking. That's vetting. That's vetting somebody who's talking as a public figure. Exactly. That's something every news organization does. That's something every fucking YouTuber does. That's absolutely fucking preposterous. The only reason 
why anybody gives a shit about any of this is because they're positioning themselves as being persecuted. This is that is a fucking SJW tactic. Oh, my persecution. Oh, my persecution. This right. is why it's wrong. And although it is not yet clear exactly how involved in Kraut's server Sargon was, they were clearly in regular dialogue on the subject. A Skype conversation between the two had Sargon feebly request that Kraut not act, advice that was evidently ignored. As Coach Red Pill himself explains, likely inside a circle of superfluous DSLRs, Carl should have done more. From the way that they're talking, it's as if Sargon and Kraut had been speaking before. So when I said in yesterday's video that um, perhaps as early as December 11th, Sargon was aware of what was going on, we're going to have to push that date a lot farther back. Now we're moving into the territory of November, okay? So Sargon and Bakad knew for several weeks what uh, Kraut and T was up to. Since he knew, he should have put a stop to it. He should have stopped to it instantly. The second that he heard about what was going on, he should have said, no, this is unacceptable. He should have acted like a leader. That's what I said. Ultimately, Sargon knew Krauts was performing what is commonly known as gay ops, and yet stood idly by and let it happen. In fact, he later admitted on Andy Worski's Stay the Fuck Back show that he was fully aware Krauts was gathering information on his adversaries, but simply didn't care. I don't know that he's doing things that are underhanded. I know that he personally is googling people's histories. No, which... no, no, but did he lie? Sorry? Because did he lie when he said, Sargon told me this is wrong, this is what SJWs do. He said, I shared Coach yeah. Redpill's data with Sargon, and Sargon said, we shouldn't do this. That's yeah. what so, SJWs do. So you knew he was doing underhanded shit, right? No, no, listen, listen. I'll tell you exactly what I know, and okay. then we'll understand, won't we? Kraut was looking into the histories of people, like uh, like Coach Redpill's Russia Today f um, and his website and stuff like this, stuff stuff I, I just don't care about. I don't find that to be necessarily underhanded. He didn't say he was doing anything with this information, but I told him repeatedly, there's just no point. And it, you know, if you're thinking about doing something, then don't, obviously. But there's just no point going into this because this isn't addressing any of the arguments. As for the skeptics' ongoing debate with the alt-right, Sargon would eventually roll up his wrinkled sleeves and finally participate. His debate with Andrew Anglin of the Daily Stormer would be best remembered, both by Sargon's series of pretentious scoffs in place of well-reasoned argument, and his inability to simply engage in any sort of natural human conversation. The latter point was further emphasised by anti-Israeli Jew fucker Mike Enoch. Do you grant the the moral premise that white people have a right to their own country and you're just saying that it's impossible to make that happen? Well, I, 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 said, I said at the beginning that I didn't really want to debate the talking points because there's no point. Andrew, listen, right? Look, I, I, I thought we'd be able to have an honest conversation because as far as I'm okay, concerned... Okay, well, I'm being honest. Let, stop but go stop, ahead. We'll, we'll get back to stop the being defensive thing. and let me speak. Have you even read no, Siege, really Sargon? Have you read Siege, Sargon? Do you mind not interrupting, man? Have you read Siege? No, do you mind not interrupting? Is that okay? Yeah, I'm trying to have a conversation with you. Show so. some respect, buddy. If I, if I was on your channel, I, I would I would give you respect, all right? So you're on my show. Are you not, were you not just laughing and interrupting me a second ago? I'm the moderator. I can do whatever I want. Yeah, which it's my means show. you shouldn't do that. You should show no, no, respect. No, I can do I can do my show however no, I want. It's not sharing respect, I, is it? Even like everything necessitates violence. Right? Integration necessitated violence. They put guns at the backs of little kids to integrate them with the blacks. Okay? Then stop everything being a fucking that, pussy. About violence saying on the that your solution needs violence. Sorry, that's not a good. That's not like a gotcha. I've said. I didn't it say it was a force, gotcha. But the violence. The <laughs> violence. Andrew, Andrew up to listen, the people. Andrew, right? As far as I'm concerned, you are a Nazi. There's no point trying a okay. gotcha on a Nazi. All Sargon has to do is be honest, Sargon. Why can't you go into a thing? I don't know if they'll ever hear this, and like maybe maybe this is gonna get clipped and put on YouTube. I hope it does because this is my message to Sargon. Why can't you just fucking sit down with people and talk to them? What the fuck is yeah. wrong with you? Why does it have to be a, a snake attack? Thing? Why? Why? As what are you, as, you okay, fucking and, Cobra and Commander? Mike, Who the fuck are you? Like what? You can't like sit down and be straightforward with people. Tell people what you think. They'll tell you what they think. Then you could say, here's where we disagree. Let's fucking talk about it. What's the issue here? What's the issue? Here? But it's all like, what are you doing? You're, 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 you know, people hate you, Sargon. People fucking hate you because you're full of shit. 
You're full of shit. You're a piece of slimy fucking goo, and everyone hates you because of it. Despite being accused of bad faith arguments, Sargon was not deterred. Having previously debated the likes of Millennial Woes and Jared Taylor on the case for white nationalism, albeit not in the least bit successfully, Carl's next target was alt-right figurehead and suspected homosexual Richard Spencer. The ideas came nuts. first, the actions came second. Oh, so they, they read philosophy and then yes. they decided to create the yes, United States. that's exactly how it worked. Keep dreaming. Have oh, you read so Thomas Thomas you Thomas Thomas? Have you read yes. any any of these things? Yes. And how can you sit there and say that that's not the case? Because I don't buy into this fairy tale so of denial. Americanism, which you right. unfortunately denial. do. I get okay. denial, denial of a fairy tale. Yes. If you want, but that doesn't make them not true. Uh, both of you will disagree. Uh, Wolves, did you want to weigh in? Uh, I think it's absurd to suggest that the the people fighting that war, the majority of them understood the philosophical underpinnings. I think there were far more real world motivations there. The debate was an absolute disaster for Sargon, with even his astronomical mind unable to free itself from an endless what is white feedback loop. And having mocked Carl's incessant habit of asking opponents whether or not they have read Locke, Spencer had essentially disarmed the hapless skeptic. The debate will be best remembered for Richard Spencer's assertion that Sargon thinks he's more intelligent than he is. A quote that was immediately mean to the living shit out of. Now, when I talk about the ethnostate, yes, it is inherently idealistic. It's not liberal, Abstract. but it is inherently okay. idealistic in the sense of this is, there, there are ethnostates that exist today that, that could be protected, yes. But my conception of an ethnostate is something to shoot for. It is something that should, it should be a telos, a great goal that we channel our actions towards. Uh, so I, I agree there is a, it is interesting to, to think about pragmatism and idealism, but there's no fundamental contradiction in terms of what I'm saying. What you're saying is no different to what I'm saying. You just disagree with the goal. No, that's not what yes, I just Richard, said very clearly. Do you want me to time, reiterate I'm myself, no. Sargon? I think it's evidence. We have to say things like don't 10 understand times for you to understand them. No, Richard, it's obvious to everyone. You don't understand what I'm saying. It's really no, it's, your long pause. It's, it's not. Just come Sargon, on. It's Stop not. trying to be a dick. Sargon, I am really sorry. I, I you're gonna find this insulting. You think that you are more intelligent than you are, and that is I, a I difficult place for now. you to be. God, you, I, okay, I what, no, what I'm describing I reality. I'm describing this what experience with you. You're telling me what I think. So what color? Come on. <laughs> oh, give me a break. Uh, so on. That no, part. don't give you. You just told me what I think. I don't know. What I you didn't think. tell you oh, what you God. think. Oh, I said you. You have a conception of your intellectual abilities that are greater than reality, and that is a difficult place for any human being to be. So this, this that is, is my description of you, Sargon, and I am sorry, you but I have to be honest to you, and you should actually thank me for being so honest. demonstrably wrong. As always, Sargon later summoned his gypsy handmaid V to once again validate his retarded fantasies as to what exactly happened. Hey everyone, so uh, I thought I'd uh, do a quick after-action report with um, people who messaged me about the debate on Andy Worski's channel with Richard Spencer. Um, so, V, how did you think it, how did you find it, uh, in general? These delusions of grandeur would be further exacerbated with Sargon's actual creation of a political fucking movement. Having summoned his troop of Discordian sycophants, centralising everybody into one manageable server, work began on establishing what was nonsensically named the Liberalists, starting with founding principles. Right, so what I've done, just to clear up any misconceptions that people may have, I've decided I like the term liberalist to describe a an activist who is a proponent of classical liberalism, which can bleed into social liberalism and possibly even some forms of libertarianism, something like this, but um, to describe someone who is an advocate of a basic set of principles. And so I'm happy with liberalist because it just fits the naming convention and no one else was using it. These principles were revised many times following mounting criticism as to how utterly convoluted their ideas really were. Necklace race realist Mike Enoch was once again on the case, referring to liberalism as small-brained grug shit. If you, if you break down, he had this big video about it where he broke down, and I, I don't want to digress into this, but yeah. I'll just say it anyway. We thought he about, about his philosophy. liberalist philosophy. It was such nonsense. 
Uh, Dude, it's the, the smallest. Guy, it's literally the smallest brain shit I've ever seen in my life. But oh, I'm an individual. The level of small oh, brain dear. is like it's. I can't even. Grog individual. Grog living yeah, own keg. <laughs> <cave. laughs> grog rock belonged to Grog. Just know everybody rock. This Grog rock. This Grog, grog will cave. trade rock for other rock, as long as rock right respected. <laughs> grog no discriminate grog against right other to grogs. Rock. Grog exclusive right to rock must be respected. <laughs> Grog, no discriminate against other rock. <laughs> yes, anyway. In fact, such was Enoch's relentless ability to strike a Sargonian nerve that the uber-witted liberalist was now reduced to fleeing at the sight of the white supremacist. Oh boy, it looks like I stepped into a little bit of a thing here. What's going on? You stepped into a pile of shit. I am first. Let's hear I am when the white comes in. When, no, yeah, yeah, well, no. I'm sorry, I don't know what the current argument is, so if you guys finish Let's up, then I'll, I'll try and pick No, no, no. Up. The thing go. is, when I, when, I, when I say... I'm... When I say about this racism thing that like yeah i don't have a de definition of it. i just use whatever it is that the other person's using like you want to use race racism i'll use it the way you use it right because there is no one correct the definition oh, of I, racism. I disagree with this. that's if, all if i'm saying comes well, up you can me. disagree but you're arguing about definitions right. of words very productive oh, oh, this oh, yeah. like a if a progressive yeah, comes up on your mind is their thing. Thing. If, if a progressive no Gabriel Lopez, five bucks. Mike shows up. Saigon runs away. We need to find the one that has this effect on V. <laughs> Godzilla, 37. Five dollar Canadian. Sargon will never face Enoch. Nuff said. A succession of cringe-inducing IRL meetups followed, with social clubs filled with parliamentary LARPers. The entire charade was nothing more than a giant ego massage for Sargon, with no real plan of what he wanted these liberalists to actually achieve. <sighs> Did you see the meetup, by the way, Tonka? The libertarianism meetup that happened? Or oh, the fight? No, 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 the one that got infiltrated. Some some guy showed up to a film Sargon walking around the block like eight times before going in to deal with these people. <laughs> no way. Right, so we're on the trail of Sargon. So Sar Sargon's just walked past me, and we are... We are heading down here. He's just gone into this. There we go. The Lord cometh. His people await. Oh, he appears to be entering the pub that I'm in, actually. Right, so Sargon's just walked past his people, but he doesn't want to arrive before there's before there's a, a great many of them gathered. So the footage I've just captured where I followed Sargon was sort of his shame, because he doesn't want to approach this small enclave of people. So he's rounding the building, he's doing laps of the block, He's walking past me frequently before he approaches this group of people. Three hours later. All in all, this was a brief and forgettable period for Sargon of Akkad. And the less said about this throng of conceited spurgs, the better. So Sargon, what's with the fucking fart huffing? Well, I think Louis explained it. Well, you, you can know, explain it, because he does, does he speak for you? I find it funny how he's going about it, and I find the name to be funny. It's the only one I could think of. I mean, it logically makes sense, and it's not already taken. So, honestly, when, when someone who understands political philosophy explains to you why, like, being shocked that a group of individualists can form a group, you're going to feel really dumb. I'm, I'm not even joking, man. Oh it's, my god, do I need to read more? Do I need to read some more Locke to get up on your level? <laughs> the, the, I mean, the reason I'm talking about it on these like basic principle level is because the people we're dealing with disagree on the basic principle level. And That's what, what people are you disagreeing with? Because you talked about your enemies in that video. So who are your yeah, enemies? The SJWs and the alt-rights. Any, any so alt okay, wait, no, no, no. So the alt-right is your enemy? Yeah. Have you not looked at the way they treat me? Do they not treat you kindly? Do you think they did? I I don't know. People Is talk shit on the internet all the time. I get, like I get shit to talk about on the internet all the time. Well, that's that's good. I don't I don't do that as much. You don't get shit talked. Oh, well, I get shit talked all the time. I just don't spend too much time indulging in it. Oh, okay. okay. 
As Sargon's alt-right debate came to a pitiable end, one in particular would cause a tidal wave of controversy, with potentially the most damaging moment in Sargon's career to date. In a discussion on white nationalism with Michelle Caitlin, Carl would become gradually more and more distracted by the live stream's chat. I'm really, I'm just not in the mood to deal with this kind of disrespect. And I know it sounds like, oh my God, he's demanding respect. But yeah, to be honest with you, do you not think that like, we should have a level of decorum in interpersonal interactions? And it's that like, the internet is bullying me. I'm not saying you're bullying me. I'm saying there's just no point dealing with this kind of attitude. As the rhetoric in the chat significantly worsened, something magical happened. Sargon snapped. You, know, you, you guys understand that I am a person. And look, yeah, yeah, like, sorry, Nisakis, and how dare I hurt your sensitive feelings. Look, you carry on, but don't expect me to then have a debate with one of your faggots. See, look, look, this is what I mean about the chat. I just can't be bothered to deal with people who treat me like this. It's, it's really annoying. Like, I... You are acting like a bunch of niggers, just so you know. You you act like white niggers. Exactly how you describe black people acting is the impression I get dealing with the alt-right. In slight defense of Sargon, there was clearly a wider context for his use of the N-word. After all, he was simply making the point that the chats were acting in exactly the same way as what Sargon saw as their racist stereotype of black people. But in doing so, he had played directly into their hands. This audio clip could now be weaponized against him at any time, especially if Karl harbored any sort of political ambitions going forward. Once again, this represented another total lack of tact and foresight for Mr. Benjamin. Carl, now the, what we just heard you say there, that's a prime example of something I've talked about with you before, uh, that you seem to think that you're really, really good and adept at um, co-opting the ways in which the alt-right talk um, and uh, flipping it back on them in some sort of satirical way, almost sort of meta-satire or whatever. Um, but, uh, but you really fucking aren't. As it happens, involving himself in the wider political sphere is exactly what Sargon the Stupid would do next. Completely disregarding his terribly checkered past and its impact on his political profile, Carl Benjamin would follow the example set by a drunk Scottish halfwit and join the UK Independence Party. The madman has fucking done it, and to be honest with you, what other options do we have at this point? This is fucking important in my opinion, so I've decided I'm going to be joining UKIP too. By the time that this video is up, I'll be a member of UKIP, and I'll leave a link in the description if you want to come with me and Dankula and join UKIP as well, because fuck the way things are going. Count Dankula, a self-titled comedian famed for teaching his dog to see Kyle, pledged to join the party upon receipt of 10,000 retweets. Knowing such a move will likely trigger the libs, Sargon followed, as too did Paul Joseph Watson and Milo Yiannopoulos. We really were in for some epic bands. You really want to know why I joined UKIP? <laughs> but for all of their salty goodness, none of those headlines could beat this one. Meet the new face of UKIP, the free speech extremist who could make UKIP dangerous again. <laughs> the media response was equally damning with Right Wing Watch running the headline, self-described classical liberal YouTubers join far-right European political party. Meanwhile, The Guardian chose the headline, UKIP welcomed social media activists linked to alt-right into party. And finally, in Russia today, Count Dankula and Sargon are simply labelled as alt-righters who joined UKIP to spite anti-race campaigners. Enough with this goofy, cringeworthy self-indulgence and self-promotion. Getting the right deal on Brexit is important, and if it's going to happen, there needs to be a formidable and serious political party with serious people willing to fight for the British people and push for that deal. That needs to be UKIP's focus and role going forward. UKIP needs to be a serious party, not a hangout for YouTube skeptics that want to dabble in party politics to get clicks. I'm not opposed to social media strategies, obviously they can be hugely effective, but with Sargon running their youth media strategy, UKIP is in for a whole lot of petty e-celeb fights with not much else. But for Gerald Batten's UKIP party, this fresh injection of edgy e-celebs were just the jolts this otherwise decomposing group needed. At last, the media were finally paying attention. Hey everyone, I'm here with Gerald Batten, the current leader of UKIP and NEP. How are you doing Gerald? Hello Carl, nice to see you. And it wasn't long before Sargon and Count Dankula were put to work. With new proposed EU legislation on copyrights threatening Europeans' ability to post memes, Batten sent the pair of political incompetence to Brussels to make a difference. What are you doing, man? I have absolutely no idea. I'm just winging it. I just wanted to go and buy some magic cards. I just thought, 
I just made my dog raise his paw. <laughs> and now, <laughs> and suddenly I'm fucking here. I blame you for this, Anita. <laughs> yep. We just wanted to play video games. Unironically, that's yeah. all I wanted. And then you decided to start fucking with us. <laughs> now, now we're in here. After fusing to create a new form known as Sargula, the feckless twosome would go on to host a panel in efforts to convince somebody, anybody, to simply listen to their uninformed gibberish. I find the whole idea of this quite disturbing because the idea that I should say if I make a movie review of a Disney film, under these rules, if I use a clip of the film, then I own Disney money. What was most immediate to those watching Cole's great big Belgian adventure was his terribly fitted suit and short-sleeved shirt. Put simply, he looked a right plonker. And with Jim, known better as Mr. Metica, comparing his appearance to an Applebee's waiter, all of Sargon's parliamentary efforts were reduced to a fucking meme. Let me, um, let me set the mood for you. It takes place at an Applebee's. There's our waiter, trying to bring us a nice soy latte. Look at him. He looks so proud of his outfit, doesn't he? Isn't he handsome? What a handsome boy he is. Well, our, our big boy, our big Applebee's waiter boy, uh, he's very proud of his outfit. He's very proud of his amazing looking suit. It's highly tailored. I think it's Italian. Upon hearing Jim's unrelenting assault of light banter, Sargon would once again overreact in a flurry of oversensitive retorts. Carl would question whether Metica even owned a suit, before bragging at how super important his political role-playing is. Even the most polished of them are not as clever as you think. And now I say this as a person who has recently been meeting politicians. There's me with the head of UKIP, Jared Batten, David Coburn, the head of UKIP Scotland, and Cam Dankula. You didn't get to meet Nigel Farage either, who's an absolute legend, by the way. He's... I, I, I'm going to admit, I fanboyed. I, Dankula was just like, you fucking fanboyed, man. I was like, I know, I know. In a response stream titled Goodbye Carl, Jim spent over two hours berating Sargon and his ill-fitted suit, coining the now popular moniker Sargon of Applebee's. And uh, these are some of the messages I received from Sargon of Akkad while he was preparing to speak at the fucking uh, European Union. Jim is a scared little boy who needs to bully those smaller than him. I'm literally dealing with pan-European politics. I have a press conference about Article 11 and Article 13 today. I will be wearing a suit. Jim probably doesn't even own a suit. Blown the fuck out. How, how am I going to... Pan-European politics? He's going to be wearing a suit. I don't, how can I compete with that? A follow-up stream a week later saw Jim play leaked audio of a conversation between Sargon and a fellow UKIP member, during which he admitted to only joining the party to make a statement, whilst further proclaiming to not really care about party politics. So I mean, I think you're interested in, in getting more involved with the party politics, right, since you're now a member, or at least are in the no, process really, of being... I'm not really interested in any kind of party politics. Then why did you join the party? <clears throat> so I have something to support. You don't have to join a party to support it. You can just like vote and go to the sidelines, but you specifically decide. Do you decide think I should to... tell thousands of people not to join UKIP? Well, that's not what I'm saying at all. What I'm saying is, is that if you want to be involved in the internals of the party politics, you become a member. If you want to vote for them, you go to the ballot box and you vote. Yeah, but I want, I want to declare my colours. I'm not interested in getting involved in internal, internal party politics. Well, you, you could have just said, well, I support UKIP and just not join then. I mean, it, it sends a different message. Yeah, I know, but this sends a weightier message. Yeah, but the thing is, is that, like, does it though? I mean, you've already got every... I don't, I don't think it does, because I think if you're declaring as a member, you're going to have, like, internal access, you're going to be given options to canvas and such for us. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I think... I, I think that you're when you consciously opt in for something like that, I think you're declaring a little bit of an interest in that. There we go. Okay, well, I, I guess I'll have a different opinion on that one. Hmm, fair enough. So I'm not, I'm not really interested in the, the, in the internal politics, but I, I am interested in being able to say, no, I'm a member of UKIP, and therefore... 
As Jim points out, it could be argued Sargon's entire UKIP stunt was little more than another disingenuous grab at media attention. After failing miserably to make any sort of difference to the passing of Article 13, Sargon's revolving door of half-baked ideas now creaked to a graceless halt. In a cheap attempt to win back favour amongst his vocal adversaries, he would unexpectedly return to Ethan Ralph's The Killstream. In a peculiar hangout featuring former Gamergating comrade Mr. Metica, Snorgon would spend over 40 minutes filibustering to thousands of bemused listeners. His totally not ludicrous idea was to somehow revive the Gamergate movement by forcing Donald Trump to tweet about it. And aside from the obvious lack of feasibility, detail and purpose, this was actually one of Carl's better ideas. I'm thrilled that you guys, the some of the core people in gaming are here so I can talk to you about this. This is exactly what I wanted. Do you not think it would be really interesting to see how far we can make this go? Who's we? I, that sounds very collectivist. Collective. I thought we were individualists here, Carl. The collective internet. Do you not think that would be funny? Do you I mean, think anybody on the gamer? internet gives two fucks about Gamergate at this point? It's it's no, become a joke. No, like no, I don't, Jim. That's the point. That's the that's the entire point. <laughs> what is your pitch exactly? Get get the band back together? Is that what is that what you're saying? Like I don't. Sargon, what's dumb as fuck is saying, let's do Gamergate 2.0. I'd rather I'm fuck myself with a rake than do that. Have, but you know, I know that's where you went. You, you don't know what the proposal is yet, but you've made assumptions. Uh, what, what you're building up to sure sounds dumb, but okay, I guess I can admit I'm wrong if you've got a better angle. Let's hear it. Yeah, I do. I do. You ready? Uh, yeah. Yep. Yeah, we are. Yeah. I reckon we can get Donald Trump to defend Gamergate. <laughs> No. Clearly missing those Gamergate days gone by, Sargon would continue undeterred, presenting his ingenious concept to Andy Stand Your Ground Ski. The difficulty is, at this point skeptics like Carl Benjamin had used up their Gamergate cachet with an endless blitzkrieg of hopped up e-dramatics, and as a result, nobody wanted to know. Let's just make them think that there's a giant resurgence of Gamergate, and dude, they're gonna flip out. But, but isn't it like, like heading on the kill stream and here or, or anywhere, like how you've been going around, is it just like saying that it's a troll to laugh about it? Is that like revealing the secret plan? It, it really seemed thing? like you had a, had a, 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 a sort of thought out plan. Like I, 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 like I didn't get to really understand the end game of it. Well, the, the end game is to further continue to make the left continue, the SJWs continue to further melt down. You know, let's add our fuel to that fire. In a rare period of humble self-reflection, Carl Benjamin took a long welcome break from the internet, and finally laid to rest his retarded feud with all those poking fun at him. I'm joking, of course. Instead, Sargon would go on to Dick Masterson's The Dick Show to restate an earlier accusation of Mr. Medica grooming fucking children. I think we've established exactly the way that my good friend Jim works. He he finds a group of young kids and then encourages them to join him on his on his escapades. And again, I, I'm going to call this grooming because that's exactly what it is when a guy <laughs> when a guy who's nearly 30 goes to a bunch of kids that are 14 and encourages them to do things. I think the pedo thing was uh, upsetting for people. It that's is because they can they they don't really know the word, the definition of the word. That's all. Of grooming. Yeah. Yeah. What do you? Yeah, Sean, but like if you, you say you this person's grooming. grooming children, nobody thinks, ah, oh, they're he's teaching them how to do their taxes, no, no, and how yeah. to fill out of their their resumes. Nobody thinks you're talking about well, doing their hair. No, I think it's a well, but I I I, I always think of it as a like a precursor to yeah. pedophilia, or I mean, pe pedophilia can be in your mind. I mean, a pedophile doesn't have to act it on like it. Sounds like pedophilia right? is in a lot of people's minds. Yeah. What the fuck are you guys yeah. talking? About? They, like you <laughs> but, groom children in all the, you know, in yeah, like, yeah, yeah. No, grooming can have thieves and stuff. You know? yeah. Sure, no grooming. Yes, grooming can can be wider than that. But the way yeah. that it at least has been used recently is there's even there's even like legal verbiage that that's used in the U.S. Um, for that, specifically relating to pedophilia. Yeah. It seemed but like you wanted to call him a creep with okay, kids. Well, I'm, not, I'm not from the US, so I didn't know that. This peculiar claim would stem from his earlier Hello Jim stream, with Sargon using an eight-year-old audio clip of Jim denigrating a 17-year-old homosexual pedophile as some sort of evidence of his so-called grooming behavior. And he hangs out in a group that's full of paranoia and lies, and he grooms these young lads to go and troll people on the internet for his 
amusement and ego. Okay, wow, I mean, no wonder he's afraid of being doxxed. I mean, Jesus Christ, imagine if you were doxxed and you had your name attached to this behaviour forever. Jim, of course, responded to the accusation with his usual level of gleeful astonishment, highlighting the sheer desperation of such outlandish claims. Sargon's underlying suggestion was that because Jim's sweetie squad may include one or two teenage shit posters, he was therefore emotionally grooming children with his content. Sargon of a cod thinks, I'm Big Boss. He thinks I'm Big Boss on the internet, and I have an army of mercenary children wreaking havoc on web forums from here to hell and back. It really bothers me because my friend Jim is sick. Sargon's pedophilic allegations would quickly bite the impulsive Ukipper square on the bottom. Yet another audio clip was unearthed, this time of Carl Benjamin appearing sympathetic to child molesters, saying how it depends on the child, before screaming, but it's true, it's true, to claims that the Catholic Church shares the same belief. I was well under the age of uh, 11 when I started having sex. And so what I like to do is put people on the, uh, what? on the other side of the argument. It's like, what you have to do is you have to say that someone like me, not anybody else, but me, that I was too stupid to appreciate the nature and quality of what I was, what I was doing at the time. Hmm. So please convince me I didn't know what I was doing. Yeah, I think, um, I think it's, yeah, it depends on the child really, doesn't it? Because... Oh. What? Some kids. That's what the Catholics say. Well, it's true. And, you know, it's, wait, it's what? True, though, you know. No, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Justicar uh, says, he says that's what the Catholics say. And then Sargon immediately follows that up with, it's true, it's true. To be fair to Sargon, there was a larger context to the discussion, and Carl claims to have simply exercised a thought experiment. His reasoning seems to be that there could be a case in which a child is molested, and the results are not entirely negative. But this does not in any way excuse the predation of children, and a strong case could be made that Sargon was far more sympathetic of pedophiles than he should have otherwise been. Additionally, to have been so vocal in his outrageous claims against Mr. Metica, only to have later entertained some sort of pedophilic pity party, again proved just how packed full of fecal matter this man truly is. But in fairness to Sargon, it's not like his degeneracy sunk to, let's say, sexting compliments to pre-op transsexuals. Well, apparently he did exactly that. The thing is, right, like I'm I'm all for being polite about trans people. If they if they if they make an effort, you know, and go through all the motions and yeah. and really really make the effort. And I think I think okay, fine. I can I can I can say you're a she, you know, it's fine, you know. Yeah. Um I, I you know, I'm not obviously I'm not going to date someone like that because like, it's not my thing, but like, you know, no judgment. If you are, that's fine. Cool, I don't care. Yeah. You know. And uh, and Blair White obviously puts a lot of work into looking as good as Blair White looks. And so she put a little it, more like, work into just, it. In my, sorry, I'm, she should put a little more into it. In my opinion, instead of blocking me, she should put a little more work into it. That's <laughs> well, my I, I instead of going just, on Max's show. Be, sort of, yeah. No, I, I, I was Google just Blair White. The fact that you know you look very beautiful to to, to me. The way I was looking at it was uh, as in like a compliment to the amount of work she'd done. Yeah. Um, but I, I, I left like my screen share up on a stream or something, and uh, my wife saw it, and then she's like angry. And I think I left that up on a fucking screen yeah, as well. Like yeah, yeah. Was she really pissed? Uh, she, yeah, yeah. Only to like explain, look, Lena, uh, darling, I was. That's that's a man who's transitioned to becoming a woman. But it would soon be Mr. Metica himself being subjected to the next bout of YouTube histrionics as what appeared to be Jim's dogs was released in a Kiwi Farms thread. In a post submitted by Princess Tinkle Panties, Metica's real name was revealed as James P. O'Shaughnessy, a race-mixing tater coon in his late 30s. I've started a kick fund me. Uh, it's pretty simple. Uh, I'm sad, and I need your fucking money, so you need to pay me. That's how we're going to get through this. I've been doxxed, and I need your fucking money. You need to pay me. That's how KickFundMe works. You don't really get a product. I just make demands and you give me money. It's been a hard decision to come to, but I think, I think I'm gonna have to hang it up. I think I'm gonna have to walk away. This might be the end. If you're unfamiliar, 
I've been doxxed. The so-called dox came courtesy of what was claimed to be Mr. Metica's voting record, although as it stands, no concrete proof tying Jim to Mr. O'Shaughnessy has yet been provided. However, Kiwi Farms administrator Josh Moon stood by the information during a conversation with Gunt Gunterson on an episode of The Kill Stream. Are you guys standing by the dox? I mean, you seem to be saying that it's, it's legit. I've never seen Zed fuck up. Zed, Zed does good work. And if he says it's true, I believe him. But this this one has been floating around for like four or five years. It's already on his ED article. That's yeah. not new. No, it's not new, but the verification is new. And when speaking directly to Jim, Josh of Kiwi Farms shared his strong belief that Sargon of a card, with help from crowds, actually paid for the docks. Hey, hey, skeptic fans, suck my dick. I'm going to burn it to the ground and you can't fucking stop me. Cry about it, you little faggots. Oh, a reckoning is coming. You can't do a fucking thing about it. Welcome to the age of the sweetie squad. Well, you let me ask you, Jim. Nuts. What is your opinion on my theory regarding well, what, Sargon what was, personally what, being involved with uh, Kraut and paying money for somebody to try to dox you? I, I don't know. It, it's just, isn't it really convenient? I mean, isn't it really interesting and coincidental, Josh, that it's the same fucking group of people that constantly comes from? I mean, this is, you know, they. I think they think they're dealing with toddlers where they can throw out the, well, do you have evidence? Do you have a videotape of me uh, personally doing this? Well, nigger, I mean, grow the fuck up. Now here's where it gets a little confusing. The eight-year-old Metica audio used in Sargon's Hello Jim stream, during which he heavily implied Mr. Metica was a child groomer, was sourced by Sargon to Encyclopedia Dramatica. However, it was later revealed that Sargon had himself uploaded the clip to Encyclopedia Dramatica, along with other historic Jim-related material. This was assumingly done to give Sargon an excuse to expose Jim without eyebrows being raised. So Sargon, in a plasma-minded stupor, had uploaded his own source, only to later act like he'd naturally stumbled on some new ED drop to make a video about, and all so he could further support his retardedly unfounded claim of Jim being a pedophile. Now that right there is some Amiga brain shit indeed. And with a folder on his desktop marked Jim, it appeared Sargon was, after all, dabbling in gay ops. Now, whether this means Josh is correct in his assertion that Sargon paid for Jim's dogs is not currently known. But even your average shit-slinging half-tard could at least attempt at putting two and two together. However, Lord Carl of Wiltshire's fat-headed crusade had only just begun. Time to cut those lines and refuel. A lot of good points in it, mostly focusing on, on how how communicate human community sargon was on a warpath and having done his utmost to best jim he was now ready for phase two of his cunning plan ethan ralph's kill stream but he just needed that right moment luckily for carl where some saw the chance to give terminally sick children a fighting shot sargon the real victim saw an opportunity to seek petty retaliation at the kid's expense. The kill stream had nobly raised $26,000 in super chats to go towards chemotherapy treatments at St. Jude's Hospital, an article written by donkey-faced riceball Yuri Ko of the Wall Street Journal would accuse Ethan Ralph of cultivating the same pit of hatred that spurred on October 27th synagogue shooter. Virtue, of course, of those pesky super chats. It seems Sargon would apparently sooner see dead children than miss his chance at hurting Ralph. The bitter skeptic retweeted Mr. Meto Groomer's tweet at mentioning both the Wall Street Journal and the FBI, highlighting Andy Worski and Ethan Ralph's problematic supporters. I, I don't know, why are you why are you using the tactics of the people that you bitch about all the time and uh, make money off of? Help you. you see, I, I've decided to defect to the SJWs. I work with for the Wall Street Journal now. I'm actually well, you're, you're tweeting account. at them. You're tweeting at yeah, them yeah, yeah. Uh, well, I'm, 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 to get I'm Andy Worski in trouble. Did he, did, he many, did he make too many did he make too many suit jokes for your taste, Carl? Yes. Yeah, yeah, it was the suit. I was really bothered about it. I, I heard, I heard, I heard. I, I heard. Well, yeah, I can no, actually no, get the Wall Street Journal. Well, we can talk right over else. each other. I can do that all day, too. You do? <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, that's not a problem. I that's just, I, I find it amazing that you just deplatform people. I bet you do. You're such a fucking snake. I am. I, I can you do are. it with a retweet. I can literally do it with a retweet. You better be careful. It's the that. attempt. It's the same shit. Are you, not, are you not afraid? You don't worry. It's the it's same thing. Oh, my channel already went down and it went back up. Again, thanks to Keemstar. Gamers rise up, Carl. Yeah. 
Oh, I'll, I'll have to keep trying. The retweets came courtesy of Sargon hiding behind his secret backworldsman alt account, clearly lacking the moral fortitude to object to Ralph and his racist super chats in person. Then again, we're clearly far beyond any sort of ethical standards at this point. Am I still on Twitter? Yeah, at back, backworldsman1, if you can find it. And Are you actually still there? Well, it's just a shit. Is that publicly you? I thought you were trying well, to do that. No, don't give a shit. Shit. It's a Twitter account with like 100 followers. If it gets tanked, I'll just create another one. Shit, yeah. using that. What, what's, the, um, what's the URL? Uh, Backworldsman1. The twisted irony here is that Sargon is always first to bitch moan and complain the minute a hit piece is published at his expense, but goes on to display upper apathy to levels of actual endorsement the moment one of his enemies is in the crossfire. God, you've yeah. lost touch. You've I lost know, I know. It's terrible, touch with reality. Holy shit, girl. Yeah, you should go to the Wall Street Journal. Is there, no, okay. is there a joke or banter here? I'm waiting for your hot tag. I'm waiting for you. You're the, you're the, you're you've the, you're had the, five years preparing with SJWs. Where's, Jim, the, the, where's the fire, Carl? So do you do you guys agree with Ralph that the SJWs just met over? Who pack? cares? We're talking about your ass. Who cares about oh, the SJWs? I don't care about the SJWs. Well, of course That's you do. You're you a fucking broken about. record. We've heard this shit for the last five years. We're talking and about Ralph's you today. channel got <laughs> taken out for, for hate speech. Yeah, and then you yeah, you, and happily right, right, retweeted, yeah. you happily retweeted at the people that did it to try to have yeah. it happen to Andy because you're a cunt. Yeah, you're a snake. You're and a fucking you're snake. You're next, Jim. You're, you're next. a snake, just you're like next, your friends Jim. are snakes, just like yeah, Crowd was a snake. Snakes. A total nest yeah. of vipers. You're better than us, and you're covered in shit. Good job. YouTube immediately banned Ethan from the platform thus removing his main source of income. They then returned the donations meant for St. Jude's Hospital to the Super Chatters, resulting in the trending of hashtag WSJ kills kids. Sargon's response was to point and laugh, whilst threatening in jest to remove Jim next. And although it's unlikely Sargon's retweet contributed much, if anything, to the Killstream's actual downfall, to even attempt to add to the overall deplatforming noise given his own media troubles, exposes the flabby elitist as yet another of the internet's swarm of self-serving hypocrites. Well, why did you retweet that? Because it's funny. Because fuck you, Ralph, that's why. Was it funny? Yeah, to me. It's fuck funny you. It's funny to try to, you know, get yeah, people to sick, sick them on Andy? That's what the tweet was trying to do. It was funny to spread it's, that around. Why is that funny? So dogging. we were already taken down. Why is it funny to try to take his channel down? Fuck you. Okay. Well, your kid dying was fucking funny. How about that? Now you want wonder why I say fuck you. Well, I didn't say that until you said shit like that. <laughs> okay, Ralph. I never once, I never once made yeah, those jokes, even though they were there else. for the taking. No, never anything. God damn it, Ralph. I gotta go. <laughs> However, in yet another of those delightful flashes of serendipity, Sargon would go on to take the exact same monetary beatdown as suffered by Ethan Ralph, as his Patreon account was dramatically terminated. It would appear that those at Patreon would be hand-delivered an entire buffet of historical racism, with Sargon's white nigger tantrum a particular treat. After giving Sargon the option of apologizing for his racial transgressions in exchange for clemency, he would instead take a retarded stand against the platform's terms of service. So I woke up the other morning to thousands of messages from all my various friends and subscribers and whoever else on the internet. And I thought, oh, blimey, that's odd. And they were all talking about my Patreon. So I went to check it, and lo and behold, my Patreon wasn't there. Jack never replied to my email, but I was sent this by many of my patrons, where Patreon had replied to them when they asked what had happened to my Patreon account. Hi there, thank you for reaching out. This page was removed by a trust and safety team for violating our community guidelines. At Patreon, we believe in freedom of speech, and we are creating a platform that empowers creators to share and debate ideas. The creator in question used racial and homophobic slurs as insults in a conversation shared online. As a result, that page has been removed from Patreon. This was Sargon at his victimized best, as he would continue in his constant quest to show the world how fucking unfair life for Carl Benjamin really is. Understandably, the news was of particular interest to those gallant kill streamers, who took the opportunity to tap dance on the rotting corpse of Sargon's five figure monthly salary. Then deplatforming you from YouTube was a sign of the times, you know, it's, it's only a matter of time before Sargon was gonna go, you know? Yeah, and I know, and that's actually what we said on the show, and, you know, he was laughing and having a chuckle about it, and we were saying, man, you must be really dumb, because don't you know that eventually they're going to come for you? I mean, not, I don't know, I probably couldn't have stopped it anyway, but uh, he just seemed to be a little uh, flippant about it. Maybe maybe he really thought it, that wasn't going to happen, stuff like this to him. The thing is, he'd gather more sympathy now in his situation if he wasn't so smug about your deplatforming, if he wasn't trying to get Warsky deplatformed. You know, it, the way he went about your deplatforming, well, 
it's all back on him now. An eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. You know, this is comic justice. Yeah, I have to agree. It's really hard for me to muster up a lot of sympathy. However, in what could only be explained by some sort of pre-existing Kekistani bond, Jordan Peterson threw his far more significant weight, metaphorically of course, Sargon is far, far fatter, behind the liberalist, offering to close his $80,000 a month Patreon account in protest to their abusive actions. Apparently, Dave Rubin did something similar, but truth be told, who would honestly notice? So, Dave, why don't you describe what we talked about today? Yeah, well, first, I think we should just make it very clear for everybody how significant what happened to Carl Benjamin Sargon of Akkad is. Also, given that it, it's also the case that he didn't break patrons' rules of engagement, the ones that they stated, and that Conte had talked to you about the fact that that wasn't going to happen, and that Patreon hasn't responded well to this. So, what we're going to try to do as fast as we possibly can, is to set this system up on a subscriber model that's analogous to Patreon. It'll have a bunch of additional features, which I don't want to talk about right now, and I don't want to overpromise. but the system is, is because the system is new. The protest only succeeded in hurting fellow content creators, who each saw their subscriptions dry up to a veritable trickle. I'd like to say that I'm sorry to any other content creators who have found their patrons leaving Patreon. This seems to have become quite a large concern for Patreon themselves as well. Subscribestar, the only real competing Patreon-style platform, saw their payments processing support stripped following the arrival of Sargon of Akkad. So I wanted to give everyone an update on what's happening with Patreon and Subscribestar, because naturally, now they are coming for Subscribestar. And naturally because a lot of people are leaving Patreon but still want to use a service similar to it, Subscribestar now has to come under attack as if Subscribestar have done anything wrong here. Dr. Tiny Tim Squirrel, PhD from Edinburgh University, has tweeted, I regret to inform you all that Sargon Senovich, Ian Miles Chung et al. have found a dodgy new Patreon alternative called Subscribestar, which appears to have started up earlier this year and is actively courting the platform content creators. They use PayPal, Amazon Web Services, Stripe, GoDaddy, he tags Sleeping Giants, which is an account that is dedicated to harassing corporations to deplatform and defund their political opponents. Look them up if you don't believe me, that is the entire reason for their existence. God only knows who funds them! Now it goes without saying that Patreon's decision to ban users for speech outside their platform is an abominable approach to creator support. Ultimately, Sargon should never have been banned, and Patreon has set an awful precedent for anybody looking to monetize their content. But for Carl, it's always a case of one rule for Ralph and no rules for me. And despite his carnival of liquid shit negatively affecting almost everybody around him, such as those on Subscribestar having difficulty getting paid or those on Patreon seeing their pledges crumble, it always seems to be Sargon who we ought to feel bad for. Why should anyone feel safe on your platform when while trying to do damage control, your trust and safety team just reinforces this message to everyone. The progressive corporations are in charge and you have no rights. Did I get a warning? Did I get an email? A phone call? A chance to explain myself? A chance maybe to make amends? No, I got my livelihood deleted without warning, as if I was some kind of sinner beyond redemption. With the political state in Britain reducing the fundamental concept of democracy to a series of best out of three dice rolls, UKIP stood ready to launch an all-out attack on the anti-Brexiteers. And with the UK now extending the leave date to late 2019, parties readied their MEPs for the upcoming European parliamentary elections. In what has to be the most thoughtless of selection decisions in global politics, UKIP leader Gerald Batten for some reason approved the nomination of Carl Benjamin as MEP candidate for Gloucestershire. My name is Carl Benjamin, I am a member of the United Kingdom Independence Party, and I'm campaigning to be an MEP for the southwest of England. So our favourite Applebee's waiter is going to be running for an MEP position, uh, one of two candidates in his geographical area, however they haven't worked out. And uh, he's, he's giving it a serious run. Uh, Godspeed. I hope, uh, I hope my waiter can at least get me my food to me hot before he, uh, he goes and saves Europe. Now, I think during his, you know, acceptance speech when UKIP put forward the nomination to have him as a, a contender, as a candidate, uh, he had told people, all we need to do 
as get Donald Trump to tweet about Gamergate and Europe is saved. As expected, Sargon was met with an assault of media backlash as a result. During a bizarre press conference with Batten and fellow MEP candidate Mark Count Dankula Meachin, Sargon was asked about a tweet sent to Labour MP Jess Phillips in 2016, joking how, I wouldn't even rape you. Sargon responded by attempting, unsuccessfully, to channel Donald Trump's unique ability to bite back. Mr. Batten suggested earlier that if I would like to hold his candidate to account, I should turn up at your press conference and ask the question. Okay. So I would like to ask Carl Benjamin why you think it is acceptable to say on Twitter that you wouldn't even rape a female Labour MP. Oh, because I don't think that there is any difference in any the way that we should treat them. Unlike the establishment, unlike our judges, who literally say if you were a man, I would have sent you to jail. I think we should treat women the same as men. And that means if a woman is being a giant bitch and laughing at male suicide, I'm going to be a giant dick back to her. <laughs> Any questions? So it's acceptable. Yes! <laughs> It was a scene reminiscent to Jordan Peterson's confrontation with Kathy Newman. That is, if Peterson happened to be a mentally deranged spurg with the charisma of a malignant tumour. Either way, the narrative was set. UKIP would now be inundated with Sargon's back catalogue of internet baggage. This included the Daily Mail's expose of Carl Benjamin's comments on the sexual abuse of minors. Now, UKIP candidate, who said he wouldn't even rape a Labour MP, says it's okay to sexually abuse boys. Police are examining sickening statements about child abuse made by a highly controversial UKIP candidate. Carl Benjamin was formally adopted by the party as a candidate for the European elections last week, despite fury over his remarks that he wouldn't even rape a Labour MP. Now, a senior UKIP source has told the Mail on Sunday that they have passed a dossier to the Wilshire police containing deeply offensive remarks made by Mr. Benjamin, an online vlogger who calls himself Sargon of Akkad. The situation for the party went from bad to really fucking bad, as comments accusing Jewish people of identity politics over the Holocaust, before claiming to not give a shit about the event, surfaced. To make matters even worse, Sargon's official UKIP Twitter account was then banned due to his prior behaviour on the platform. This prompted claims of election meddling, as many believed correctly that, as a political candidate, he deserves the same platform as his opponents. But with mounting pressure from the press following headlines such as The Sun's top UKIP candidate says it's okay to rape young boys in sick YouTube rants, it's hard to see Sargon being part of the political scenery for too long. You went to the Wiltshire Police and got my number to talk to me about a five-year-old stream where I was having a, a conversation in the abstract with a victim of sexual assault. That's really interesting. About what? Why would they? Okay. And what did I say the age of consent should be in that, that stream? You don't know. Yes, I did. At 1905 timestamp, I said exactly what I think it is. You are the shittest journalist that has ever existed. You are, just go at 1905. Go watch that fucking timestamp, you dirty, dirty smear merchant. Holy shit, you should be embarrassed of yourself. What do you think you do, honestly? A media firestorm followed, with The Independent highlighting Sargon defending his use of the N-word, saying, I find racist jokes funny. The Mail Online took the fight to Gerald Batten himself, claiming he defended rape tweet about Labour MP as satire. So dire was the situation that UKIP's own Gloucestershire website was taken down in protest of Carl Benjamin's MEP candidacy. But Batten would not be deterred, and would rather see his party dragged into Sargon's pin-headed weeds than focus on the urgent matters in hand, namely delivering Brexit. You said it was a satirical comment. What did you mean by that? Well, that's, the, go and ask Carl Benjamin. This is a three-year-old tweet that he did in the context of some Twitter trolling that what people were doing. No, I'm not asking and about I don't the really, comments he made. I'm yeah, asking I, about your defence of his comments, because he remains a UKIP candidate, and you are the leader of the does. party, and we, so you have made uh, a decision we, to keep him as a candidate. He has made an Ill, ill-considered remark. And if you were going to stop people taking part in public life or anything else because of some stupid, ill-considered remark of several years before, then I don't think you'd have anybody 
anybody in Parliament or anywhere else in public life because we all do things which we regret. He can defend it or not as he likes, but I'm not going to stop having a valuable candidate on the list, someone who can get us access to social media and thousands more people that we can talk to that we can't do through social media where few and few people, are, sorry, less and less people are actually listening to it or taking notice of it. So we're seeking other avenues to the public. That kind of comment, though, has prompted some concerns. How many times are you going to ask me the voters? same question? How many times are you going to ask me the same question? Thank you very much. As it stands, Carl Benjamin is set to contend the European elections as a UKIP representative. And although most of his positions in this ongoing media conflict are at the very least defendable, Sargon's political crusade is ultimately doing serious damage to both the UK Independence Party and to Brexit overall. The difficulty here is that Sargon is once right to feel victimised. What is happening to Carl Benjamin is by all metrics a political smear, and he has every right to at least feel hard done by. But it was Sargon's own naivety and total lack of foresight that facilitated this entire shitshow. Sargon's insatiable thirst for attention saw him put his ego ahead of both UKIP and the Brexit movement. He joined the party and then ran as an MEP, knowing full well that opposition research might find a few gems. For years, he allowed himself to be drawn in to an unending saga of YouTubian dramatics, and has said and done some incredibly stupid things as a result. But so trapped in this e-celeb hook box was Sargon, that he unwittingly facilitated the media's distorted portrayal of Brexiteers as a bunch of child-raping shit posters. The Leave campaign was fundamentally successful because Nigel Farage's no-nonsense message was palatable to 17.4 million of your average Britons. Unfortunately, Sargon possesses neither the charisma to match Nigel's appeal as a political statesman, nor the public exposure to set voters at ease. Now, Sargon's fight for free expression is of course a worthy pursuit, but Brexit is far too important to allow one or two excitable edgelords to dilute the entire fucking narrative and veer the Leave campaign way off course. By playing directly into Remainer's stereotypes of gammon-faced bigots, Sargon is completely undermining the entire Leave strategy. Furthermore, he has rendered the entire UKIP campaign an endless wiping of Carl Benjamin's spoiled anus. This desperate attempt to act out some sort of parliamentary fantasy on behalf of what is now a redundant party at the blind expense of the greater good, and all for that sweet taste of ego massaging validation, shows just how big-brained Sargon of a card truly is.